The first chapter of our book is called Chapter 1, Why Technical People Need and Fear Technical Writing. And it's going to give us a good sense of the class as a whole. Um, to start us off, each week we will have an outline. And this will lay out the key concepts of what we'll cover each week, and then we'll delve into the content. So this week we're going to cover the role of writing in the technical workplace, why you can learn to write well, what makes for good technical writing, and the writing or planning process. Not only is this a good outline for the chapter, but this is sort of indicative of the entire technical writing course. So. This will kind of set us up for the entire semester and kind of get us thinking about how we'll handle the entire approach to technical and scientific writing as a whole. So first off, we're going to take a look at the extent of writing in the technical workplace. Um, I know some of you have more scientific workplaces as well, but keep in mind we're kind of going to use those changes, terms interchangeably. Um, when you're in a technical or scientific or even a business workplace, there's often a need for continual record keeping. Um, when I was working in a business industry, um, we often referred to this as covering our hinds. So hopefully it's not the same way in your workplace, but there is a need to keep meticulous and good orderly records. So continual need for record keeping. As a human being, it's very difficult for you to remember the things that you've done. One way you can do that is by keeping those good notes, keeping those good records. Um, oftentimes, too, you have to remember that these processes and these things that you're doing, and especially those of you in scientific fields, others need to be able to come along and replicate what you've done if you haven't recorded it properly and if you haven't recorded it thoroughly. There's not a way for others to be able to come along and do that. However, if you've been taking those good notes, you don't have to rely on memory and you don't have to turn around and verbally tell someone if you've been taking good notes, then you have those to reference back and you can create reports to form a permanent record of your work. Um, and decisions so that others in your organization can benefit from your record keeping. So keep that in mind as you are creating your documents. Um, you'll see too as you are out in the workforce that your documents will begin to be used to add to the store of knowledge and experience within your firm and industry. Uh, actually, as you're moving into your workplaces, one way to gain workplace credibility is to become a subject matter expert. The more you can show that you can adapt to your workplace and to gain credibility and demonstrate your knowledge is to adapt to quickly adapting to your workplace, learning those genres, adapting to the writing styles and demonstrating your knowledge um, and putting those documents out there. Um, one way to do that reports uh, record the due diligence with which you performed your tasks which may have legal implications, may be required to legitimize your findings, may be used to do billing, and so on. So, for example, when I worked in banking, um, many of the processes and procedures that we followed, for example, I did foreclosures on houses. It was imperative that every step that I took in the legal process be recorded with due diligence to show that I didn't just willy-nilly go from point A to point D, without following all of the small steps in between to do my due diligence. Um, otherwise, it could have had legal implications on me personally. By being meticulous about noting things, by making sure that all of my documentation was in order, and also making sure that the processes and procedures I put in place for my team were in order, then I knew that everybody on my team was following the guidelines for our states and our procedures to ensure that we were all on the same page and we were doing the right thing so that I didn't have to worry about somebody turning around and saying, you people don't know what you're doing. You've foreclosed on 10 houses in Florida without taking into consideration that you have to do a bid for sale in this way before you do this. So very important that you have 
all of your steps recorded properly. And this can be any number of things, not just a legal process, but it can be any number of processes that you might encounter when you're out in the workforce. So due diligence can range in any number of processes. So see what they are in your work workplace. Make sure you're doing things to ensure that you're performing your due diligence. Keep in mind too, the technical workplace works on the free and continual flow of information and must be widely available. Your reports become part of the technical conversation within your company, organization, profession, even your society. Nobody likes an information hoarder. Um, it's important to remember that your contributions will become part of your company. You want to make them so that everyone can use them, everyone can read them and it's possible that they become out there for everybody to use. When I worked at a large bank around here, Fifth Third Bank, I wrote a massive bankruptcy manual um, because we used multiple systems. It was a very inefficient process, but the manual, uh, I believe, lives on today. I haven't checked in a while, but last time I checked a year or two ago, they were still using it. And I had started this, I was, still I don't even think I was married yet my husband and I have been married for 17 years so I created the manual it was, it was massive and it has been modified and edited a number of times but the core manual still lives on to this day so this thing I started almost 20 years ago still exists in fifth third lore and I don't know who's responsible for it now but start it with me and just think you could have something like that in your profession. Remember, record keeping and reporting takes place at every step of a job or project, from inspiration to requests for proposals, to proposals, to acceptance and contract signing, to progress reports, completion reports, and so on. It's just important to keep good records. You never know when something will come back. Um, it's just good to do this on a number of fronts. Having learned the keep everything, cover yourself mentality at Fifth Third, which is where I worked immediately out of college, up to this day, I keep archives of everything. So if you come to me in 15 years and say, hey, will you write a letter of recommendation for me because I want to go back to graduate school and there's no chance you'll remember me, I'll I'll be able to remember you. I'll, I'll pull our email exchanges or whatever archives I have and I'll say, no, I remember you. I pulled and, and I have this paper and you and I sat and edited together. And it's just handy for that. Not just, not because something could potentially go wrong. It's just a good idea to hold on to things. And that sounds a bit like a hoarder mentality, but it's just a good idea. Alternately, in academia, even if, if somebody comes along and does a great dispute or something after the fact, I have all my documentation in line so I can say, well, here's my justification for having given this grade or here's what happened. So you never know what situation can come up. Having documentation to support it's just helpful. All the research you do on any project will be courtesy of the writings of the others. So having that handy, of course, and documented. Well, well documented research just makes it easy for everybody else. They can quickly pull your sources and access those if need be. Same with any paper that you write. So remember, for all these vital reasons, technical professions spend between 20% and 40% of their workday writing, depending on industry and position. So not a made up statistic, understand real data. Writing's important. It's an indispensable part of every technical person's toolbox. Um, I have a master's in rhetoric and composition. When I got this, it was, I graduated in 2012. There weren't a ton of writing type degrees out there. So I was actually in class with a lot of different professionals who were coming from technical fields and had to come back because they needed those critical writing skills. Um, so they were coming back because they desperately needed that help. 
it's, it's great that you're in this class. I mentioned in someone's post, and I might have put it on the discussion board at some point, but of all the things that we require educationally, I'm not sure why we don't require more technical writing or more business writing, because to me, having been a supervisor at a large bank, having worked at a nonprofit, and now teaching business writing, and having been um, assisting with some graduate level teaching, I, I don't, and looking at writing, I don't understand why we are not requiring this because this is a skill set that people desperately need. Remember, too, without the ability to write, you're very unlikely to succeed in your field. And I will tell you that having a master's degree in English, you think, well, what, what in the world can you do with that? I had my master's degree in English and it triggered multiple promotions for me at a bank. And time and again, people would tell me, oh my gosh, I, I wish I had a master's degree in English. I can't tell you how, how much I wish I could write. These were upper level people at the bank. Ultimately, one of my job responsibilities, in addition to supervising a team for foreclosure and bankruptcy, was to go and write the vice president's um, weekly rally or monthly rally the troops newsletter because his writing skills were so poor. So can I tell you what a wonderful networking opportunity it was and how much recognition and FaceTime I got with somebody multiple levels above me? to go and sit with him every month is face to face one to two hours one on one time with him to sit and write this. And I had to get to know him. I had to get to know his personality. I had to understand him and how he talked and um, to be able to channel his voice enough to write his newsletter. Um, I got to know a lot of details, a lot of behind the scenes information and slowly, but surely when things came up, um, opportunities uh, such as on the committees for um, employee engagement and things. I was the first to know about them and I said, wow, you know, that's, I, I love that committee. I would love to sit on that committee. I was put on that committee. Why? Proximity to this person. Uh, because I was able to sit there and say, well, gosh, I would really like to be on this committee. It was that easy. Why? Just because I was there. Because I could write. Because right place, right time. Um, so it's a benefit. A point. Technical writing isn't like literary writing. So if you're coming into this class with that sense of existential dread where you're like, oh no, adjectives and pronouns and garens and what are all those other things? What, what, do, what am I going to have to do? Just stop. I, I, I'm not going to have you mapping sentences and stuff like that. That's not a thing here. <laughs> Don't worry about that. Remember, writing is not a gift. It's a craft. Um, this isn't the class where we're going to be creating characters and things like that. I mean, if you want to do that, we can have a separate conversation because we, we can do that all day long. But for this class, none of that. What we're doing here, this is the one with rules. This is the one with guidelines. It's very process driven. It's very much guided by guidelines. It's almost like there are templates for everything. Um, just remember that we are not here to be fancy. We're here to convey information clearly. We're here to get from point A to point B. We are here to guide a process and we're going to do that as clearly and concisely as humanly possible. We want to use the simplest words and shortest phrases we can, and we don't worry about repetitive language. Now, granted, my videos are very long because I use a lot of words when I'm speaking verbally, but brevity is key when we're actually doing the writing. Again, we're never going to use more words than necessary. We don't pad for length. We don't use difficult language to impress. So here, the, the 50 cent SAT words that win prizes and accolades and like your English 2089s and your English 1001s will not get you any impress impressive grades from me. So if, if that was wonderful then, I mean, yes, I will be impressed here, but not necessary. So if it's necessary for the process, that's great. 
but don't feel like you need to bust out the thesaurus for this process. So unless it's absolutely necessary, you don't have to. Here we are looking to write instructions. We are looking to target a specific audience. Oftentimes it's going to be a consumer, a coworker, a colleague. We're going to have distinct people in mind and we want to communicate with them in the most efficient way possible. And if they don't need the fancy words, we're not going to give them the fancy words. We're going to give them what they need with as few words as possible. Remember, when you're a technical or scientific person, you're well suited to no-nonsense communication styles because that's who you are. <laughs> and you're well suited to working along guidelines and best practices. These are standard in your workplace. So, you know, I, I'm not a scientific person, but I remember enough about basic science to remember that there are lab procedures and processes. When you walk in, there are certain things that you have to do. Same here. So as exciting as that all was, what are our basic attributes of technical writing? We're going to look at those real quick. And essentially it comes down to four basic things. Clarity. It has to be understood the first time it's read by its intended audience. Think about it. If you can get somebody to read directions, and that's a big if, you're going to need to get them to be able to understand it the first time. Chances are they're not going to read it multiple times. So, if at all possible, one and done. It also needs to be complete. So, it needs to contain all the necessary information for the audience to understand and follow up on it. We don't want to have loose ends. We don't want it to leave unanswered questions. Um, this isn't a murder mystery. It needs to say all that it needs to say, and it needs to say it in as little space as humanly possible. So, completeness. Conciseness. You need to be clear. It needs to be complete needs to do so in as few words as humanly possible. Clarity, completeness, conciseness. And then of course the odd A, accessibility. So you want it to be organized and tagged, headings, bullets, and the like, just like this list, and make the information easy to find. Um, so as quick, easy, painless as possible. And of course, all documents need to be free of factual errors and errors in grammar. So that's just a little side note. Should go without saying, but it doesn't. Um, a lot of people forget it, it can be as complete and concise as possible, but if you have a bunch of grammatical errors in there, don't forget grammar can change meanings. So it is very important that we check for those. And again, we're not going to harp on grammar, we're not going to teach grammar, but you do need to do a basic grammar check. And we do have tools for that. So, I'm going to take a look at this email and go over why it is not a great email. I'm going to give you a second to read it. You might want to pause. Uh, before I start going into taking it apart, and then we'll go into it. So I'm going to stop talking for a second, believe it or not, and let you pause. Okay, so some things that you've probably considered as to why it is that this is not a great email. First, the subject line. Proposal. This is not a clear subject line. Is this a proposal? No, it's really not. It's about a proposal, but it's not clear which one. If we're working in the same office together, chances are we have more than one. Um, so be a little more clear in your subject line. This subject line doesn't give 
sufficient information. This is also um, irritating with any email. For example, if you're sending a professor an email, such as, I don't know, me, and you're asking me about the assignment, well, if we're in the middle of the semester, chances are we have more than one assignment. <laughs> and I adore each and every one of you. I really truly do, even though I, I haven't met you yet and haven't talked to you yet. But I teach other classes too. And when I get your email, I may or may not immediately know which class you're in. So you're asking me about the assignment. I'm not 100% sure which class you're in off the top of my head. I might have two sections of 4092. So it's hard to know which assignment, which class. They may not run concurrently. And you're asking about the assignment. Here you're asking about proposal. So it's important to be clear. If you're truly talking about a proposal, then say specifically the cost or proposal or the approach to preparing for the cost or proposal or something like that, but definitely be more specific with your subject line. Um, if you're asking about an assignment, say the editing for clarity assignment or chapter three quiz or whatever it is that you're truly asking about, just something to be a little more cognizant about. That way you can get an answer back because if I can tell you a response right away, I will. So your first paragraph here, um, it's not very concise. Most of the first paragraph is a long and unnecessary preamble to the main idea. So here you've got just a lot of jibber jabber. <laughs> so if you can make that more brief, make it more brief. Um, in your second paragraph, not yours, but in this email, when is the meeting? The email doesn't actually give complete and necessary information. Here it kind of goes on and on and on, um, but it never actually specifies when that is. Here again, information isn't quickly accessible. The meeting items are spread throughout the email and material, it's just everywhere. So what are some ways we can get that under control? So here, if you can go, go ahead and take another look, I'll pause and let you see some ways that this is improved, but some areas that also need to be fixed. All right, so here you have an unclear, complete subject line. Um, the email is a request for a meeting on a specific proposal. Um, it's been fixed, so now we know that this is a request for a meeting about the Pinnacle draft proposal. Yay. Um, the opening statement now identifies the main idea clearly and concisely. No longer struggling there. The meeting items are gathered in one location and highlighted with bullets, making the key information easily accessible. The email includes the meeting time provides all the information the reader will need to show up for the meeting and prepare for it. So, big improvements. So let's look at the writing process. Everything goes better when you have a plan. Writing's no different. Um, when you were doing formal writing um, and more elaborate writing, you did this with outlining. Even when you do shorter documents like emails, just like the ones we looked at, um, you do these better if you have some kind of plan in mind. So when we are doing our writing process, you want to take these steps in mind. You want to make sure that you determine the purpose of your document. This is crucial no matter what you're writing, and that's universal. It doesn't matter 
what you're writing, whether it's for this class, whether it's a book, whether it's a poem, whether it's a birthday card. Who's your audience? That's always the number one thing you need to consider. Then you want to brainstorm the content. Organize the content. Determine the correct writing style. Write the first draft quickly. Revise in stages. Many people will try to revise as they write. Don't try to do this. You'll get so caught up in revising that you will forget good points that you're trying to make. I would also encourage you to that as you're entering new workplaces, um, just like with that email, make sure that you're aware of your corporate culture. So the first thing you want to do is determine the purpose of your document. As soon as you set out on your writing journey, you want to know exactly what your document is intended to accomplish. Um, you can't get very far if you don't know what your mission is. Once you know that mission, you want to make sure that anything that you're including in this document is relevant to that purpose. If it is not directly related to the purpose, then you don't want that information included. So if it's extraneous, you want to take it out. So nothing extra. You want to make sure that the purpose focuses the document and makes it easy to come up with a clear opening statement and subject line or heading. So everything should tie back to that subject line and heading. Your opening should keep it all together and everything should really be related. Everything should be centrally make sense and it should all stay focused. Next, and again, key to everything, consider your audience. Remember that different audiences require different kinds of information and or persuasion. Um, if you took English here, I'm sure you remember that that's one of the things that we reiterated time and again was persuasion um, and appeals. Remember that decision makers require managerial information, such as costs and outcomes and general procedures. Summaries help get them the gist of your document. Context helps them understand how your document fits into the organization's work as a whole. Um, people like experts require technical details and clear process descriptions. They have the technical know-how to assess the merit of your idea and its feasibility. I would say that, again, keep in mind, um, when you're out in your job, Look at things that have been submitted similar to this before um, and, and look at your corporate culture. Some other things to consider. Agents implement the ideas in your document and they require clear instructions formatted for easy reference. General readers are non-technical and may be outside your organization. They require definition of terms, clear description of basic clear descriptions of basic concepts and processes. So if you're trying to replicate a lab experiment and you want someone like me to be able to do it at home with common elements, um, you want to make sure that you give me clear cut instructions so that I don't accidentally blow myself up. Brainstorm the content. Once you know what you want to accomplish and to whom you're speaking, you want to really start thinking about what you're going to say in this document. Um, you want to set the information that your particular reader needs in order to understand what you need them to understand. So some ways to consider organizing content is to look at it as what do you want? How can I help you? Context would be, why are you telling me this, and what's this got to do with me? The details. Okay, now tell me exactly what happened or exactly what you need, and the next step. What have you done about this? What do you need me or someone else to do? The main points, called the summary in a report. The context or background for the report, and this tells how the report came to be written. Details, all the relevant facts, findings, and specifics of the report situation. 
the next step, what needs to happen next, what you have done or what you need the reader to do. And then finally, determine the style. Some situations require greater formality. If you were speaking to your reader instead of writing, how formally would you speak? So again, this is gonna go back to who were you writing to? Um, you want to use a very similar tone to the way you would speak in your writing. So if you would speak to this person very formally, if this is your boss's boss's boss, if this is a president of your company and you saw them in the elevator and you would straighten up and you would start smoothing out your outfit and straightening your hair and you would clear your throat and speak very formally, hello, Mr. So-and-so, hello, Mrs. So-and-so, hello, how are you today? Um, then chances are your report should be very formal. So make sure that tone is conveyed in your report or whatever it is that you're writing. Remember that all writing in business is more formal than emails sent to friends. So even if you are friendly, it, it still needs to be professional, even if it's hey Jen in emails. Again, when you're writing, write that first draft quickly. You now know what you are going to write, you know what the order is, and you know what tone it is. Again, if you let yourself get bogged down in the details, you're going to get too hung up on that, and it's going to weigh you down. You might lose that important information. Imagine yourself sitting across the desk from your reader and write your first draft quickly. Don't pause to edit. This is generally good advice with anything you write. Um, if no one's given this advice to you up until now, I'm really sorry that they haven't, but if you're trying to do that editing while you're writing, you've been tripping yourself up. Write pretty much what you would say. So a lot of people call this brain vomit. Sorry if that's gross to you, but that's really what it is. Just let it go. There's plenty of time to go back and edit. You should be doing an editing process anyway. And honestly, if you try to edit while you write, you'll miss more than you'll catch. Your first draft should flow pretty smoothly. So like Elsa says, let it go, let it go. And just let it get on the page, then go back and edit. It's better that way. Now you want to revise in stages. All writing requires editing. Say it again for the people in the back. All writing requires editing. Edit in stages, proceeding from large changes to small. Um, and, and that's really how you want to do it. Instead of really concerning yourself with looking at minuscule changes, really focus on content first and foremost. Look for the bigger picture items. Focus on making sure you have the big ticket items, clear, concise, the important things, the subject matter. Is that working? Are those things working first and foremost? Once you have that down, then make sure your style works. Make sure all your content will be perfectly clear to your reader. Because if your content's not working and your style's not working, that's what you need to be focused on. Once those things are good, then you go back and work on grammar, punctuation, and mechanics. Because none of that matters if the other things aren't working. No point in editing sentences for style if you haven't made sure they appear in the right place in the document. So, hope that makes sense. So, as I said, writing well is not magic. Definitely a learnable technique. Could necessarily teach you how to write a wonderful creative fiction story because that is one of those things that sometimes people just have to be able to do. But technical writing is not the same thing. It is one of those things that is a craft. Um, you can learn it, you can edit, you can make it something that works for you. So I think that you can see from this not very concise, <laughs> um, but very complete PowerPoint and introduction lecture that this is something that you can work with this semester and I do look forward to working with you. If you have any questions on this chapter, definitely let me know and see you later.